Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show, and I am winding down. As some of you may know, this is the second to last audio recording of the Chat Show. Um, and then there'll be one giant live March 2nd uh, extravaganza on stage at the Dynasty Time Powder Theater. My guest then will be uh, Pamela Adlon, she of the brilliant show Better Things on the FX Network. And then uh, Jim Jeffries, one of the greatest uh, comedy minds of your lifetime um, and mine. Very excited about that. Sam and Jamie will be back for the roundup. They are not here today as, uh, as they haven't been for the audio uh, versions of the show. And I refuse to apologize. Senator, Senator, you owe my client an apology. Senator, this... All right. Uh... <laughs> Charlie don't surf. Very racist now. Uh, I think it was then also, <laughs> as intended. Um, yeah, so we're wrapping up. So I can ask, I can finally stop asking you to write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com unless you just have final comments like, uh, thank God you stopped doing this. kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I want to thank the folks at uh, Earwolf Studios uh, for today's auspices as well as... Uh, well, the last one I do soon. And then, you know, like a year from now when Maisel's canceled and I suddenly have a lot of more free time in my hands and I, uh, or I'm just canceled from Maisel. That's probably how it's going to go down. Kevin, we just don't know how to keep you on the show. Um, and then I come crawling back. It's one of my, that'll be the name of my third book, When I Came Crawling Back. Um Thanks to you all. Those of you who give a good goddamn about the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, season two is there waiting for you on the Amazon Prime when you get done buying socks. And uh, we're back to work next week, or uh, two weeks, on uh, uh, on the season three. And um, you can follow me on the Twitter, Instagram with stories about that, for I will not be following up with you here. So, yay. Um, let's get to our guest, shall we, because uh, he's been kind enough to uh, remove some of his clothing while I was just talking to you. And, uh, it's a pleasure beyond description. Please welcome back, return guest. We've had so very few in the 400 shows we've done, Mr. James Roday. James! Yes, KP? Uh, how are you, buddy? I'm wearing a dance belt today so that I could uh, uh -huh. do that little strip tease for you while you were talking about who the F knows what. Uh huh. Uh, Where have you come to us from today? Uh, this was incredibly convenient. I'm not going to lie to you. All right. Um, you want to give a street address? The house that I've been renting is uh, about six minutes from here. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me about the I, that I've been renting you on a big hit uh, broadcast television well, show. I can't seem to get uh, a job that doesn't shoot in um, British Columbia. So uh, I spend most of my time The there. new uh, ABC hit television show, A Million Little Things, it's, also shoots in fucking Vancouver? It's, van it's the classic Vancouver for Boston chestnut that uh, <laughs> has been out there since David E. Kelly started making shows, I think. Um, Are you? Have you run for mayor yet? I haven't, man. I keep telling myself that like- Dual citizenship? It's something I should look into, honestly, because I've spent more time there over the last, you know- 13 years than I have in, in the United States. And and what is that about? Pending war? You know, it turned, <laughs> it's become that. I'll say this. Uh -huh. it's, it, maybe it's a little uh, irresponsible, but waking up in Vancouver in a bubble where the first thing you, you don't get smacked in the face with is how shitty things are uh -huh. in America <laughs> is kind of nice it's okay. a little bit of a luxury and it certainly lends itself to uh, a better working environment again write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com with all of your uh, tirades regarding james roday's hatred of america yeah. um uh yeah no i hear you yeah and also um what it's i love also about canadian crew right so it's like yes. that's not what they're really talking about either at all they're mostly talking about hockey so yeah and everyone in america who talks about these issues no matter what group they're in or what side they're on yeah they're we're all preaching to the choir true. we're not reaching out to anyone across party lines and having an open conversation that is uh, absolutely correct yeah it's the worst us versus them in our lifetime that's for damn sure certainly in yours 
Um, I Thank go, you for acknowledging that I'm a I go back Springer to chicken than you, KP. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I start, by the way, you look jacked. <laughs> are you I, are I, you playing a villain you, in a... <laughs> In an Avengers movie or something, and this you, is a big uh, surprise that we're not supposed to know about? You met my better half, Jamie, who just turned 37, although she <laughs> reads at a 61-year-old level. Uh, you know, have you ever seen the cartoon where the baby goes to sleep in the crib and the cat jumps in there and sucks the life force out of it while it breathes? Oh, sure, yeah. That's what I do with Jamie when she falls asleep. Oh, I like that. Yeah, so we're, we've reversed. I like that. She now looks like a 60-year-old Jew, Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm Okay. Yeah. You're I'm looking, okay. You're looking good, KP. <laughs> Thank you, buddy boy. <laughs> yeah, I can see definition through your shirt when you inhale. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we all know what that means. <laughs> I'm inhaling far too loudly <laughs> or largely. Um, should we remind folks how we met? Sure. Uh, it was uh, 2001, and uh, a terrible tragedy had just befallen our country. Um, yes, it had. Nobody was uh, sure how to proceed exactly when it came to art, making art, making people laugh, things of that nature. Specifically on the comedy side, I want to say. Specifically on the comedy side. And our uh, shared buddy, uh, Tom Hayden Church, had set up a little independent film called Rolling Kansas that he was going to shoot in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the big question was, uh, because oh, almost no time had passed, like... Do we still make this movie? Is that the right thing to do? Yeah. Um, if we don't make the movie, does that mean the terrorists win? Like all of those questions were, yeah. were floating about. And um, I would say about half the people that he lined up to, to, to do that movie in like fun little cameo roles uh, dropped out for various reasons, not the least of which nobody wanted to fly. Uh, but you and I flew. To Texas. To Texas, along with uh, some other kids. And uh, we made a strange, delightful, very Tom Hayden Churchian uh, little movie. And I felt pretty good about doing it, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that I, that I did that. I'm glad we were there. I'm glad that we tried to, you know, make a piece of entertainment and, uh, and make people laugh during a time when not much was funny. Yeah. The distraction wasn't a bad thing for uh, all involved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's how I met you. That is how yeah. we met. And I was, I was, I was, I was already a fan um, of yours. You had no idea who I was, um, but I felt like in a very short period of time, um, we came to appreciate, at the very least, to appreciate each other's haunches. That's right. I had no idea who anyone was on that film, <laughs> other than the aforementioned Tommy Hayden. Tommy Church. H Church. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, yeah, that's a flawless impression <laughs> of the way that uh, Tommy H.C. has started every sentence <laughs> since 1987. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, back then, when getting to know you, I felt as though a uh, young filmmaker was in the rise. It seemed to be uh, a passion of yours. Absolutely. Uh, while you were walking through various acting roles, I sensed that... Uh, you, you wanted to say sleepwalking, didn't you? Greater good. <laughs> it's implied. It's implied. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly implied. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I think I have a faint memory of you pulling me into another film that you... Uh, Directed. I love this. I love this story because it's so, <laughs> it's such a deep, deep cut that no one will ever know unless we tell it. That's right. Uh, now, my first feature, which only took eight and a half years to mm -hmm. get made yeah. um, at a budget of under $1 million, uh, was called Gravy. That's right. It's out there to be found on, on the Amazons and the iTunes type places. Sure. You also might be lucky enough to find it at 2 a.m. on Showtime. If, That's right. If you don't sleep well. Uh, it won't help you sleep. Either. It won't help. Uh, but it was a crazy, ridiculous black comedy about cannibals um, infiltrating a Mexican restaurant and and torturing and eating people. And what made sense to me at one point um, during the, the post-production uh, of it all mm. um, was to use my buddy Kurt Smith, name drop. Sure. Uh, he one, of Tears of Fears. One half of Tears of Fears, no mm -hmm. big deal. Uh, to create... Uh, a cover uh, of an Alice Cooper song because it would be cheaper. <laughs> a lot cheaper. Um, Alice Cooper's uh, disco bloodbath boogie fever, which... Which, shockingly, still costs a lot of money. <laughs> which still costs a lot of money. Um, and then there's like a... 
there is a spoken word element yes. to that track. Done and, by? Uh, in the original, was it... Who does it in the original? Was it Vincent Price? No, that's that's what we came up with. It wasn't Boris Karloff? I feel it was somebody I iconic. wanted to be Boris Karloff for this story. Ryan, if you will. <laughs> Who? Yeah. Yeah, the name of the song again. Disco Bloodbath Boogie Fever. By Alice Cooper. On one of the records that he doesn't get a lot of love for. Yeah. Who did the spoken word portion of that portion song. of that? I'll tell you who did it on our cover for your movie, and that's Old KP. That's right, and he did it. Yeah, as Vincent Price, <laughs> which is not really wasn't in my. You don't you don't have a Vincent <laughs> Price per se. You don't walk around trumpeting it the way that you do your walking, for example. Uh huh. Um, but I asked you if you could shred something out of that, and uh, as and not surprisingly, you stepped up to the plate. <laughs> Bottom of the seventh, uh -huh. two guys on. Sure. Roped one into right center. I uh, I hit one in the gap. <laughs> you did. You did it for yeah. me, pal. Somebody rounded third, <laughs> and I got to go home. Yeah. I was very thankful. It's a very fun uh, track. Um, Kurt did a great job, too. And it and it plays over um, a spirited um, montage where three different groups of people are fighting to the death. Yeah, that's what I uh, was led to believe, and uh, I think you might have sent a little footage, and uh, I just remember thinking, uh, I, I I loved what I saw. <laughs> I can't wait to see the entire film. Yeah, the con it, you, seeing it with context might make it even more fun. <laughs> you had said that at the time. <laughs> this may not make a lot of sense. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Kurt Smith, again, our friend, uh, also wrote and produced a a opening theme song to the Kevin Pollock's chat show in the uh, in the first year we were on uh, in, in available uh, that would be 2009 um, and it was so horrible to have to call him and say looking for something a little more upbeat uh, love you to death <laughs> no I I uh, I'm so passive aggressive and 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 in a have no uh, uh, <laughs> backbone when it comes to uh, conflict or um, really any sort of um, conversation that that points out that I'm an idiot. That I just uh, transitioned from his song to the current version, which. Uh, uh, was done by Brian Tyler, this brilliant award-winning composer who played like 11 instruments. And sure. It was very jazzy and upbeat. Uh, Kurt is a sweet, sweet, precious he's a genius treasure talent. of a man. Oh, my goodness. Um, he's done so much for me over the years. He really has. And usually for a bag of peanuts, which, yeah. again, is just a testament to how many royalties he's made from Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Yes. Um, but also just one of the great all-time humans. And here's a quick uh, digression. Please. Uh, he showed up to my 40th, um, which was a surprise because I don't expect, you know, the Kurt Smiths of the world to come to CD bars. Which is why I wasn't there. That is correct. And I was so pleased and drunk when I saw him that I lifted him as mm. One yes. easily can. Sure. And swung him around and thanked him so much for coming and managed to fracture one of his ribs. Did you? I did. <laughs> and he didn't tell me for the longest time and then came clean and was like, you know, you you broke one of my ribs that night from hugging from hugging me too hard. Uh, proving once again that you, James Roday, will always be the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, a delicate, sweet man who, uh, whose rib I cracked. Who you can crack. <laughs> Let's be honest. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. So eight years uh, to get gravy afloat. How many, uh, What? tell me the genesis of your new film now, uh, called Treehouse. Now, am I to believe that it was um, always meant to be a part of this uh, Hulu anthology horror movie? Uh, it was not conceived to be that. Okay. But uh, that is the opportunity that presented itself. And so, uh, well, after eight years, you're looking for a home and some love. Exactly. And of course, because our business is so bizarre and ridiculous, uh, it's a tale of two extremes. So, Gravy was eight and a half years. This was 72 hours. Wow. Um, you know, Blumhouse, who's producing the movies for Hulu, uh, reached out, having been a fan of Gravy, which is just nice to hear. Sure. 
and said, hey, do you guys, do you have anything for this thing we're doing? We have like three months that are unaccounted for. It's a movie a month, each sort of loosely affiliated with a holiday. That's it. That's the, the anthology. In okay, case so anybody's wondering, that's what Into the Dark is, horror movies. Into the Dark is the name of the horror movie anthology that Hulu uh, has started presenting? It started or? last October. Okay. Um, Yours drops March 1st. And we will be the sixth, so we're right smack in the middle of the lineup. But uh, well, now they, you're just bragging. Yeah, because it's nice to be in the middle of anything. Oh, oh. Um, but they said, yeah, these are the months. Do you have anything? March was one of the available months. This idea that I had sort of been sitting on for years uh, and couldn't figure out how to end, which is the curse of most stories, Yeah, um, lent itself quite handily and opportunistically to International Women's Day. Uh, I pitched it, I soft pitched it on the phone and had a, had a green light three days later <laughs> with no script. Versus eight years in the making. Yeah. And to Blumhouse credit, like, I don't know who else is out there doing crazy shit like that. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so credit to them for taking those kinds of swings and, you know, it helps that they live in the sort of super micro budget world where you can actually be bold and take crazy swings like that because um, it's never for a lot of dough. Right. But for me, uh, like, it was antithetical to my previous experience, so I jumped all over it. And one of my, uh, two of my dearest friends on this planet, uh, Juliana Gwill and Jimmy Simpson, were sort of my co-pilots in, in this experience. Juliana helped kind of guide the storytelling, um, police the movie not being... Um, a man trying to make a, a, woman, a woman's movie or a man trying to mansplain a movement. Uh, she was sort of my eyes and ears and also helped me figure out how to end it, which was an interesting experience because I, I kept thinking I had come up with something cool and she would just be like, I understand why you think that's cool. No. <laughs> oh, sure. No, I, I, I get why that sounds like it would probably be a cool thing to do. You can't do that. Um, was it because you're a man? Yeah, and I think it's just optics and... It's interesting. It's like what we perceive to be the things that are important to women mm. when it comes to Me Too and Time's Up and all these movements versus sometimes what actually is important to women and wanting to get out the right message. Yeah. Um, it is such their experience. It's 100% their experience. It's, I feel it's our role to be supportive and to never suggest, much like uh, the species themselves, that we truly understand which is fair. Their thought process. By the way, they figured us out <laughs> it's real right. quick and easy. Um, We've never been able to do it. And that was the trickiest part of making this movie. And as a result, I did, um, to your point, I think, which is the smartest and most rational thing I could have done, which was just surround myself with talented women um, in just about every position, at the head of every department, uh, a patchwork quilt of of really wonderful lady artists of whom I could lean on and make sure that I wasn't just, you know, making a bad movie or... Like department heads, you made sure they were women? Everybody. It was a, a celebration of ladies um, coming together to design a movie, uh, lift a movie, and ensure that I didn't F up said movie. And then on the other side was my dear, lovely old pal, Jimmy Simpson, uh, who, wonderful actor who agreed to be a part of this before there was even a script um, kind of knowing that he was going to be taking on uh, the skin of uh, a man that I think a lot of actors just wouldn't have much interest in playing right now it's a testament to Jimmy mm -hmm. and knowing that it was a story that was worth telling and going for it uh, that's just true actor shit, KP. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Committing 100%. Yeah, yeah. And making you proud. So proud and so humbled. And as I always am, anytime I am lucky enough to direct anything, to just watch people that are frankly talented than you are buy into something that you see in your brain right, and make it better than you ever thought it could be is one of the most humbling experiences that you can have doing what we do. Well, I, I will say, though, every the best writer directors that I've worked with are great at writing and casting. And uh, I feel like you kind of nail it if you can get great department heads uh, from cinematographer on down. 
uh, to make sure you don't fuck up. And then write great and cast great. And get the fuck out of the way. Do you think that you were onto something there, KP? Yeah. I I started uh, directing Gun for Hire uh, on the first outing, but I got to do a page one rewrite about six times, which helped a lot to formulate my ideas into what it was. And then I just picked up the phone and started casting. Uh, I, th- I said to you off before we started um, that we should talk about the casting process because, I, you know, as an actor, first and foremost, I broke off a seg- segment in the one book I put out to talk about how ass backwards and designed to fail the casting process is. Uh, that book entitled How I Slept My Way to the Middle. <laughs> Not just a funny title and technically still available on Amazon. And it is nice to be in the middle as we've already covered. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I think, I think, I think, I feel like you wrote something for me in that book. I had famous people write a little something about me and I put in these inserts in the book. And I want to, fe- I want to say that you're in there. Did it? Did I, I make the yeah, cut? Yeah, I do. I, do you remember? Was this, it bun, was it this, bun related? This ask? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Uh, but, but I broke off this chapter just because, you know, it's been said a million times by other people and smarter, but, and I had this conversation recently with a casting director who was, uh, working on this next movie that I wrote that I'm allegedly directing in the fall. Very exciting. And she agreed that, of course, when you offer someone the part, the confidence they bring to the set is the polar opposite of the confidence they have when they come into the room to try out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I told her, I'm going to get a half hour behind after the first person, just so you know. <laughs> I'm going to give them notes. They're going to get 74 tries at it because I have just riddled with empathy that this is a horrible thing to do to people. And uh, a necessary one, I suppose, if you're casting a role and, it, and it's going to go to a non-famous right. person. Um, so what is your experience like being on the other side of the casting process? Um, with the movies, I have generally either written with people in mind and who know that I'm writing with them in mind right. so that I'm 80% cast before we even start yeah. the casting process. Um, but and, still. And I'm picking up like one or two roles here or there. Um, with TV, it's rarely like that. With TV, it's it's usually like... Here's the session, you know, here's 10 to 15 people. and People are put on tape and it's shown to you sort of thing? I've been mostly, I guess this is somewhat antiquated now, but I've been in a lot of rooms. Um, and I like to be in the rooms because especially if people are driving down to Manhattan Beach or some bullshit, I, I want them to feel like they at least had an experience and a real opportunity to yeah. give the best that they have on that day. Yeah. Even if you know... Frankly, after the first read that this is not the person that's right for this job, I still think there is value in getting a note, executing a note, feeling like you did a better read the second time than the first time and and walking back to your car going, okay, I didn't completely bomb that as opposed to not getting that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so I'm with you. I, I always give a note and give some and give an actor a chance to, you know, to do something different or show something different. What I love about that process, though, is that it is like may the may the best man or best woman win. And that, I think, still has a place in, in what we do mm. when so often, if you're not a famous person, it's how do I how do I get a job? Yeah, absolutely. So, so sometimes it's still the good old fashioned like there's no favorite in this mix. I don't know any of these people. These are these are actors and actresses that the casting director probably is fond of, and uh, I'm gonna go with the person who comes in and nails. Please, it the best. someone <laughs> come in and blow me away. And boom, yeah, you get the job. Yeah, shitting on Manhattan Beach aside, I couldn't <laughs> agree more with everything you said, and I I am remiss actually in forgetting how important it is to give the new people an opportunity, which is why that casting process is vital to what we do. Um, yeah, you want to just. You want to have have ideas, having written or read the script a bunch as the director. Uh, you have a person, you have a, a visual of what the who this character is, and then don't hold on to it. Let somebody come in and blow your mind. And when it happens, it's pretty special. Um, on Treehouse, we had one role that doesn't have a lot of the time on screen, but is is pivotal to say the least. And the person that we thought for sure was going to come in and do this for us ended up not being able to do it. 
and we didn't really have a backup. So all of a sudden it was just wide open. We got to find somebody. We got to find somebody. Um, and there were restrictions because, you know, she, she's playing a, uh, well, I'll just say she's, she's playing Jim, Jimmy's twin sister. So she kind of has to look like Jimmy. So already you're, you know, a whole bunch of people that are amazing can't even come in because mm. you got to buy them as twins. And uh, it was one of those situations where, you know, we saw a lot of people and nobody was quite, you know, quite what we were looking for. And then someone came in towards the very end um, who I personally wasn't super familiar with. And from the moment she started speaking, you know, the room just sort of became a tiny little airtight bubble and the little looks between us and producers and casting started happening and you start having this transcendent experience because you realize, oh, our girl's here. <laughs> and uh, it's a great feeling, especially after a, a, a long search. Yes. How do we not let her get to her car before we sign her? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty amazing feeling, too. Uh, uh, James L. Brooks, far, former guest of the show, uh, I asked him to uh, to to give the ultimate uh, statement and confirmation, rather, that the legendary story of Danny DeVito auditioning for Taxi was, in fact, urban legend or true. Turns out it is true. I don't know if you've heard it. No, but. please tell it. So they're they're auditioning for Taxi, and they're trying to figure out who's going to play Louis De Palma. Uh, written on page as, uh, you know, a, a gruff guy, but that's pretty much all you know. And um, all of what is Danny DeVito, who was far, fairly unknown at the time, walked into the room with the script in his hand, uh, tossed it onto the desk or coffee table in front of the people that uh, were auditioning him and said, who wrote this shit? Turned around and walked out. <laughs> I've never heard this story. <laughs> so I asked Jim not only to confirm that that is, in fact, what happened, which it, he did, but to say, what all did you do? How could you even begin to really appreciate that he was? I mean, did you say, yeah, yeah, that was great, but somebody go get him. would be great if he could read. Or did you really, truly know? And it was... It was it was pretty clear that they all just said, "Wow, that!" Re I mean, he had enough work that you knew this guy sure. was an actor, and then he came in and did exactly what Louis De Palma would have done, wow. and they were all like, "Okay, all right, let's get this guy to the set." Uh, on the on the Devito side, was it a calculated move, or did he really not give a shit? Uh, utterly calculated. Wow. I mean, it was. It was what every actor sort of at one point either tries or spends their whole life thinking about doing it and never does. Um, I never came in as the character, but I did come in as I, I finally realized, um, see if you can win them over before you have to attempt acting. <laughs> right. So I would come in, you know, and be uh, irreverent. Sure. And it worked about 9% of the time that's, where they thought – this guy's still funny. KP. It wasn't great what he did in the scene. Yeah. Maybe we can work on that. But I like I liked him. There was something about him. I like I would come in and say, I'm sorry, before we get started, I got, I know it's a busy long day. There's so many people not like me at all sitting in the hallway. <laughs> uh, whose office is this? Because I, I can make a call. I, raise a hand. I'm sure we can get you a bigger space in the building. <laughs> you know, and then and either they would It'd be like, Ugh, okay, monkey boy. <laughs> can, can we get to the sides now, Mr. Clever? Wow. Well, Captain Clever, can we just do the scene? Yeah. Did you have any memories of um, take, taking a shot? I embraced pretty early on that, and I I didn't, I'd convinced myself this was true. I had no evidence, right? No scientific evidence. But, uh -huh. but that the more it seemed like you wanted a job in the room, the less likely you were to get it. I believe it's true. You reek of desperation and neediness. So Be my, nervous. That's expected. So but my only real stratagem mm. um, for many, many years Big of auditioning of was mm -hmm. just um, carry yourself like you could give a flying squirrel's nut if you get the job or not. 
And yeah. I, and I felt like that served me relatively well. You have to be careful. I think there's a fine line between that and putting up too much of an air that I don't care about this. And I think the difference you undermine, is if you come in prepared, then yes. they know you care enough about it because you spent time with the material, there you go. which I always did. Yeah. So I would come in prepared yeah. having made a choice, but also like not give a shit about the small talk or if yeah. you ask me any questions afterwards or, yeah. you know. If anyone listening really cares about this and is um, in the process of having to audition, I would say that uh, Jimmy Jack here has stumbled across the most important part, which is prepare more than anyone else going in. Prepare and then make sure whatever very specific choices you've made in preparing every damn sentence that you are open to getting notes and throwing it all tossing away. Tossing it all out. But the better, you know, the better prepared you are and the more familiar you are with that material, the better position you're going to be to pivot on a dime and do yes. something completely different. Swing for the fences with your commitment. And then be prepared to bunt if that's what they ask you for. Yeah. <laughs> we need you. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know what? There's so many variations of that same advice and, and it's because it's true. Yeah. You know, you hear, you hear like, yeah, you know, do it every way till Tuesday and then check that at the door. You know, there's so many versions of the same basic advice, which is do your homework, be prepared. Yeah. But don't whatever lock else you do to anything. Whatever else you do, I would say, let that be to your own interpretation, how you handle this or that. Just make damn sure you uh, convince them that you worked your ass off. Yeah. Because it works twofold. One... You're saying, uh, I take my job seriously. I care. As I will when we get to set. So you can count on me being prepared on the day. Yeah. And two, um, you're telling them, whoever them is in each scenario, uh, that you cared about what they do enough mm. to take the time to come in and have made some choices about it. And that's just a nice l little stroke to anybody's ego. You yeah. Know? Well, uh, and now let's go on to the post-production process. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, over the 10 years I've interviewed many filmmakers and um, they all seem to love editing as the final rewrite and uh, putting together the puzzle and the ultimate version. How are you in post? Uh, I would agree with that. I think invariably you will pull one amazing rabbit out of a hat every time you or edit out of your ass or for a little ass. more serious. Like there will be one problem that seems insurmountable that you're ready to sort of bash your head against the wall. Yeah. And what do you mean? I don't have the coverage for that. <laughs> and an editor will sift through stuff and piece together something that will spark an idea. And the next thing you know, that problem is gone. Yeah. And that's what, that's the magic of what can happen in post-production for certain. And the reason that I have never, like I don't, I'm not my own editor. I haven't even like truly mastered any of the software because I really, really do appreciate what editors do. Yeah. And I know that they, a good editor is always going to, to edit better than I ever would. Sure. Even if I gave it my all just because of my constitution mm. um, and, and the patience that it takes to sit there and watch hours and hours and hours and hours of footage frame by frame yeah and have it stored in here so that if i ask you you know what i'm pretty sure we tried one where we oh yeah i got that um that's not me mm -hmm. uh <laughs> so easy to do it yeah. on the day yeah <laughs> but to log it know where it is find it and all that stuff um i have a ton of respect for what editors do they are artists for certain and i also love having uh, the additional perspective to bounce stuff off of in, Fresh eyes. in the room. Yeah. You know, it's great. I love editors. Yeah. Um, and uh, in addition to just being a fantastic editor, like every, like just about everybody else was on Treehouse, um, my editor was a lady. And so you're getting a fresh pair of eyes and a constant balance to your manly perspective on things, which is also, I think, enormously useful. Right. Um, you said this was something that got put together in 72 hours, but it was an idea that you had with no ending for, I'm told, at least six years. It was a seed that then became a seed with some meat on it that then became 
two acts of something that I thought was pretty tight. My point being, you yeah. had you had enough of this pro woman uh, story, and and uh, and what it became, well in place before any of the recent uh, so called movements. This is true. Began, and I think it's because I imagine you're going to get a lot of questions about. Oh sure, and uh, I'll take them head the on. Timing. Uh, being advantageous. It's going to feel opportunistic for sure. Um, there is no question in my mind that the reason it came together so quickly was because of where we are finally uh, mm -hmm. as a society. And that window was wider than it's ever been for a story like this. I know that if I had tried to get this movie made six years ago, five years ago, four years ago, probably would have been a completely different experience and maybe doesn't even happen. Right. Um, so there's no question that there was uh, an opportunistic element to this, but also like, thank God, because um, it means you get to tell the story. Uh, bird in hand, hell yes. Hell yes, it was. Um, but it came about, honestly, just from having so many dear lady friends in our business specifically. And, and not just hearing stories about inappropriate behavior or... Um, you know, sexual encounters that they had you know, had over the years, but just about how hard it is already to do what we do. And then the additional layer of having to put up with all that bullshit on top of it, just because there are women mm. and you don't realize how many of those stories you've logged, just hanging out with your friends over the years at dinners or at parties or whatever. Until you know, one day I just woke up and was like, God, this sucks. Yeah. This sucks so bad. Yeah. Um, and then you have a long-term girlfriend for a while and you see it through a different prism of her experience. And then you're just like, all right, like what can I do with whatever limited platform I have that, you know, goes above and beyond holding up a sign for a day? Yeah, because that's not going to do it. <laughs> like what can I do? Yeah. Um, well, I can tell a story because that's, that's what I can do. Um, but what's the right story and what's the mess, what's the right message? And because boy, what a missed opportunity it would be to, to, to have someone say, yeah, you can do this and then do it wrong. <laughs> um, so I think that's partly why it took so long. Um, and then, you know, as soon as like I said, as soon as the iron was hot and the window was open, uh, it shouldn't take much more than that to motivate you to, uh, figure out how to end your movie. <laughs> yeah. And um, did did you always know that you wanted a ninety nine point nine percent female crew and department head? I did. Um, Do it right. A because I know that I know how many talented women there are out there in every job. But also, again, it just sort of seemed. But like that goes beyond that. It does to make the effort and have the uh, game plan. Part of it was like, look how easy this is to do. Everybody like. This was not a hard thing to put together. I had multiple choices for every job. The only thing that was difficult sometimes was like, wow, I like three of these people. Like, how do I choose one? The way it would normally be. Exactly. Except then you end up with, a, you know, this awesome power lady crew. Um, but on top of that, for this movie in particular, and because of the fact that I just, and I still have a complex that like, you know, should it have should it have been written and directed by a woman? I'm not a woman, no matter how I spin it. I'm just not KP. Um, no matter how many times you shave? No matter how many times I do it, uh, how can I set myself up uh, to succeed, not like as a device or as a gimmick, but as an authentic, like everywhere I look, someone's going to be giving me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's the best way I know how to proceed with this. And Jimmy sort of was on the same page, and we were like, cool. This is how we'll do it. Um, because at the end of the day, it's like I also don't subscribe to the idea that only women can write women and only men can write men and women can't direct men and men can't direct women. That's, I, that's nonsense. Um, good storytelling is good storytelling. And this was a good story. And talented people. And talented people. And while you're making together. the point that a woman can do any of these jobs and has proven herself and I have three choices in every position, uh, now please allow this particular non-woman. Yeah. To be captain of the team. That's exactly what this movie was. Yeah. And also, you know, it was 
like I said, it was a bird in hand. We had a very brief period to make this happen because I was going to be heading up to start season one of this ABC television program. By the way, if you're still like, if you're on a network show, it's a program. Because yeah. it's just, it's a little antiquated. It's old school. I still use the word pro program <laughs> yeah, whenever program. I text somebody about my own damn thing. Like you're not on a program if you're on Game of Thrones. You're not. You're on some juggernaut thing. It's it's a different thing. Okay. <laughs> Million Little Things is a, t is a TV program. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very successful one. <laughs> it is. It's been great. But uh, I was I was headed off to do that. So the, the amount of time we had to put this together was yeah. so finite. And how, how finite? I had three weeks to write and prep the movie. That's simultaneously. That's already not possible. Simultaneously in 15 and a half days to shoot it. Um, which was the other, I thought, very like real rooted, grounded reason to be like, well, I, I, it's got to be me. Like, it's already up here. If you have three weeks to write and prep. I'm not going to hand that off how to someone do you, who doesn't know anything about the film yet. Right? How do you cast during those three weeks without a script? Um, you wrote the sides first. We had uh, almost almost every role, like with someone loosely, like well intended and attached. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of that process, there was a script, and there were sides for the couple of roles that we didn't have cast. Right. And Jimmy was a major part of the whole process, so he knew what was going on with each draft, with each pass. He was weighing in the whole time, so he was. He was starting to wrap his head around his character f from the outline phase, nice. and uh, we kind of built that together. And that's how you, that's how you do it, and it's doable. Uh, we have a portion, uh, a segment on the show since you were here last. I like it called "Famous Questions." Okay, <clears throat> the questions themselves not famous. Okay, the people who I've reached out to who know you. Oh. R. Oh, look at you doing a thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> this one comes to you from uh, one of the stars of Stand Against Evil, Janet Varney. The wonderful Dana Gould pro program yes. over on the IFC. That is correct. Oh, definitely a program. Uh, Janet Varney asked the following question. Donna, Josie, Shelley... Or Audrey, and why? Please uh, explain the question for everyone. Those are the lovely ladies of Twin Peaks. Aha! Uh -huh. My favorite television program uh -huh. of all time. Of all time. Uh, and for me, uh, the answer is simple, because while I deeply appreciate all of them. All the ladies. All the ladies. Um, perhaps my earliest true adolescent TV crush. If Real, like bordering on obsession, loiny mm -hmm. because I was of a certain age, right? Ryan, can you look up loiny, please, <laughs> just to make sure it's a word? Because if it's not, it should be. I would like to get a hashtag going immediately um, on loiny, yes. Uh, was on uh, Mage Genomic who played Shelly, and uh, not only did I have the biggest crush. Uh, of my adolescence up to that point on Shelly, it, it meant that I wanted to also be uh, Bobby, which is why many, many years later, I would uh, stalk Dana Ashbrook into becoming one of my best friends based on that pocket of time and said <laughs> obsessions. I should also add mm. that Majgen is now um, a friend, a dear friend, and it's weird what can happen in our business sometimes. Uh-huh. At what point did you share your <laughs> loiny obsession with um, your new best friend? I, I didn't wait too long. She's cool like that. Okay. Um, I was able She's to- probably heard it before. Yeah, fr from far better sources than, than me. Or not <laughs> having ever heard it from a fellow professional. Yes. But that's what can happen sometimes mm -hmm. um, in what we do. Because uh, you one day you're just a 14-year-old- um, learning about how your body works, and the next or day you're hanging you're, out. Your lips are this close uh, on camera to the lips of the person that you remember. Those of you listening, trying to do the theater of the mind, when he was saying <laughs> this close, weirdly, he was measuring out about three feet. So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you probably went the other way. Yeah, 
No, um, Machen came up to do an episode of Psych and was like the baddie of the week. And, and you guys, your characters almost kissed. And of course she was very sexy because it's impossible for her to not be that. Mm. And yeah, it was like one of those like super, super close, talky, like sexy bad guy moments. And I was just like, man, I don't, we're going to have to go again because all I was thinking about. <laughs> was being 14. Was being 14. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can yeah. we go again, please? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had to, got to, but I had to get through uh, Kissing Sherilyn Fenn mm. in a film also and um, had a very similar experience in that. You were an Audrey uh, guy. I was an Audrey guy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know. It's there were lots of. It's the guys. most obvious choice, <laughs> yes. just because the character was absurdly sultry, uh, <laughs> and not embarrassingly, I was way older than fourteen when, when that show was on. <laughs> not quite creepy age, no. Uh, no. In any stretch, what years are we talking for the Twin Peaks? Ninety, ninety-one, eighty-nine, ninety, ninety-one. That's right in there. That's the pocket. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. so I'm 30. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No. no. They were of age? Yes, that's that's uh, on paper anyways, my argument, Your Honor. That's correct. Uh, huh? So thank you, Janet Barney, for that. Um, we have a new segment on the show. I waited uh, 397 episodes before I introduced this new segment, and there are only three episodes left. I may not repeat it, okay? But I've created a new segment just for you. I appreciate that, and, it, and it, it's a uh, it's perfect because you uh, uh, had some foreshadowing in mentioning the name of this impression of mine. This segment is called "A Question from Christopher Walken." Uh, this was not rehearsed, nor do you know what the question is, nor do I know what I'm going to say. All right. But here is a question from Christopher Walken, James. <laughs> I feel I can call you that, so I'm gonna. James, here's my question for you. If, in fact, you were raised by chickens, go with me on this. I will, Christopher. You were raised by chickens. Okay. On a farm, chickens. How did you feel about your siblings? Also... What was your name? Well, uh, Mr. Walken. Yes. First of all, I I don't even get me started on what a privilege it is to, to have this brief but shared moment with you, sir. Uh, I would say I was probably fairly fond of my siblings. I think chickens often get a bad rap. And the truth is... Uh, they they probably have a lot more to give than we know. More than eggs. Yeah, I think they are. I don't know that chickens have been given a fair shake. I think people... What argument would you make well, for people who don't give this so-called fair <laughs> shake? They're free spirits, you know? I don't know that they're the sharpest tools in the shed necessarily, but uh, not known for being bright. There's a chicken in <laughs> Chinatown of New York, however, that can kick your ass a tic tac toe. Uh, no one's ever beaten the chicken. Well, you're making my case for me, and I feel like it, it's there better. There are exceptions. It's better because you're doing it. Right. Um, Still. And, and my name on the chicken farm, for reasons that I can't explain to you right now, um, which suggests you might explain it later. Entons. Entons. <laughs> I like that name. Thank you. Thank for you, a Mr. chicken. Morgan. Yeah. Hey, it's time for your feed. <laughs> Steve? Harry. Entons. <laughs> That's yeah, the visual. I would have definitely been the artistic chicken mar marching to the beat of my own. And how would people know, passerbys, what have you, that you were in fact the artistic chicken? Probably some sort of accoutrement. Uh, something tied. Staying with the French <laughs> motif. Something tied to one of my tiny, thin haunches. <laughs> a ribbon, perhaps. Something that I had found. A keepsake along the way. Um, right. Yeah. And as the last portion <laughs> of this particular segment, we reverse 
the situation. Yes. And you are allowed to ask me any question, and then we wrap up yeah. okay. the segment. This is tough. I mean, one I'm, one question for Christopher Walken. I'm, there's so many things that I know people would probably want to know, so there's a little bit of pressure involved. Uh, okay. Mr. Walken. Can I predict my answer before you ask? Yes, you can. Let's just try that. All right. But stick with your question. I've got my question. Don't acquiesce to the power of my answer. I won't do it. <clears throat> Yellow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfectly Walken-esque answer to the question whether it, whether it makes sense or not. And what was, in fact, your question? I was going to ask you who your favorite Yankee of all time was. We got it. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> I'm going to say Dave Rigetti, rags. <laughs> Pitcher, a starter for the Yankees in 1983, pitched a no-hitter on 4th of July, rags. Yeah. Dave Rigetti. Uh, to answer your question more honestly. Thank you, Mr. Walken. All right, well, that wraps it up for a question from Christopher Walken. What a shame I waited 397 <laughs> episodes to do that segment, which I think would have been a hit yeah, all this time. You really deprive people. Damn it. But I wanted it to, things to feel a little more special for you. And you and I appreciate that beyond words. Can we, uh, before we uh, circle back to Treehouse, because I want people to see this thing. Thank you. Uh, uh, more than once. Um, talk to me about uh, the new television program that uh, you're uh, in the mid. Aren't you... Technically shooting. We are done. You wrapped. You just wrapped. With season one, but right. there are still a few that haven't aired. So I think we have two left. Oh, so when do you go back for season two? Oh, June-ish. Yeah. I mean, we were we were lucky enough to get a, a much earlier pickup than I think we were expecting, which is nice because then, you know. Well, they do that based on numbers, you know. And then you can sort of get a sense of what your life will be. Oh, I am employed. Yes, for the for the next twelve cal calendar months. Uh huh. Um, so that was uh, a delightful gift. Where, where were you in the shooting process of season one when you got the word there would be a season two? We had been how many episodes had aired? I guess I should ask. Well, uh, I would say maybe fourteen, because we got the word uh, right after we wrapped the season shooting. And I think we had maybe aired 13 or 14 up to that You point. were a mid-season show. We were not. No. Wait. Um, we None were, of this makes sense. We were a fall show. We did seven. We shot 17 episodes. and uh, Already doesn't make sense. Is yeah. it normally like 13? There's a back nine? We had a back four. Sure you did. <laughs> um, Always a vote of confidence. Yes, indeed. Which is why, you know, it wasn't a given. No. <laughs> that we were coming back. But uh, what happened was... They moved us. We were on Wednesdays at like 10 p.m. Um, and we were doing okay live numbers, but lots and lots of people were recording us and watching us later. Uh huh. So, uh, and, and that's a whole nother set of analytics that have L's in front of them. Right. Um, and those numbers kept coming back strong, enough so that the new president of ABC. Oh, I thought you were saying um, Trump. Trump said, you know what, why don't we try putting this show that seems to have a pretty solid DVR fan base on a different night at a slightly earlier time with a with a lead-in that suits the show better. And so they moved us to Thursdays right after uh, Grey's Anatomy, wow. which is currently in its 43rd season. Yeah, that's been a juggernaut for them since the 40s. Still doing numbers that are very impressive. Yeah. And uh, we got a huge lift, and our numbers went up, and our DVR numbers are still solid. And I'm fairly certain that that is probably the catalyst sure. to the pickup. And so you sent flowers to the new president of the network. She's great. Um, I have not spent any time with her yet um, myself, but everything that I've heard is that she's a, a lovely lady who doesn't hate our show, mm -hmm. which is not a terrible place to be. It's a wonderful place to be. Let's get to the important questions. I yes. know everyone's ask, uh, wanting me to ask since this is an ABC show. Yes. Will you have special access to the Star Wars portion of Disneyland once it opens as a member of the Disney family who owns ABC Network? I'd like to think yes. I got to think that these You'd are the, like to think. I'd like to think that these are the kind of perks that come along with 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 being under the right umbrellas, mm -hmm. you know? For me, it's always been about, like, what network am I on and what does that mean sports-wise? 
Like what may, what professional sport do they have a deal or a package with? That can you I, could get special can I get jer- to Can I get on the field for a football game or can I get courtside for a basketball game? Or back in the old days on USA. They'd let you pitch an inning. That's right. They'd actually let me. No, uh, it was the US Open, which was great. Oh, wow. Because um, you'd get great seats for like a night session. And uh, that was the best. And then I'm going to guess you're talking about tennis. Tennis. Now that you specified night session. Yes. And so then, tough to get on the uh, course. It's true for the golfing of the U.S. Yes. Open during the evening. Uh, portion. And then uh, ESPN took all the Grand Slams, which means that ES- ABC. That's ABC. ESPN. So I'm, back in, I'm back in the saddle, man. I'm back in the saddle for tennis. Yes. Perks. Maybe you want to make those calls soon. <sighs> Between what's, season one and two, with all yeah, this success. What's up next? The French. Do I want to go to Paris and see some French Open tennis? Maybe, KP. I feel like you do. (laughs) But I want to continue to encourage you to consider this uh, when Star Wars Land opens. Sure, because I can name at least four Star Wars characters. Uh, Let's start with? Land El Carissian. Two. Boba Fett. I love that Boba Fett is two. Three. Jabba the Hutt. And four. He had to take a little extra air. Uh, Chewbacca. Nicely done. (laughs) Thank you, sir. Man, so close (laughs) to not pulling that out (laughs) right before hitting ground. Yeah. Uh, Okay. But the lesson there, as as I'm sure you absorbed, is always, always lead with Billy D. All right. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, if we've learned nothing else. um, I mean, how else would you do that? I don't know. I don't think there's another way. Uh, were there any teachers or mentors along the <laughs> way of your, uh, um, sure, unusual path, yeah. as we all are, that uh, um, you would like to bring attention to? I, I, I write this one down because I feel if there isn't, great. If there is, though, it can kind of be fun and meaningful. It's lovely, and I appreciate it. Uh, and there was a big one. Uh, his name is James Buchanan. Uh, he passed away. Uh, last year, mm-hmm. may he rest. He was the uh, director of our high school theater department. Great. He ran a tight ship. He ran that department like it was a conservatory, meaning that if you did drama, then you had to drop all of your other extracurricular stuff, which is why I gave up athletics in high school to get serious about theater. Holy crap. What was the name of the school? It was Taft High School. Correct. In San Antonio, Texas. A public school. We just got really lucky with a guy who... Where uh, did Mr. Buchanan come from that he had such a strict curriculum? He grew up in Texas himself, um, was a playwright, uh, had dabbled with some success in in New York City, Wow. had a couple plays produced, and then through a series of unfortunate events found himself uh, leaving New York, rooting himself back in his uh, home state and dedicating the rest of his natural life to being a teacher. Enter a young James Roday. And uh, who, and I depended almost entirely on him making the choice to study theater in college because I said, look, if you tell me that this is a pipe dream and I'm going to waste four years and go into insane debt, then I'm not going to do it. So it was a two-part question. It was like... <laughs> Do you think I have what it takes to, to pursue this? And if so, should I go east or west? And uh, he gave me the elusive, I, I learned later, yes to the first part. Because um, apparently he didn't say yes very often. Um, and then told me to go to New York. He probably wasn't even asked the question very often. Maybe not. Because that takes a lot of nerve. In fact, what brought? how old were you when the question was I was 17. 17. And how long had it taken leading up to your 17th year before such a question even made sense to ask? I mean, look, there's the pipe dream of a kid, right, yeah. Who, who's a fan of movies. Sure. Which you clearly were. Yes. Um, and then there's the, yeah, no, I, I feel like I could be an actor, pipe dream. And is there an application to this theory prior to this drama class? Um, before high school, not really. I just loved movies and, um, felt like you could do it. Yeah. And then, you know, I wasn't, I was, I was playing like all the, all the ball sports and not getting particularly tall. You were going to tap out at <laughs> five, nine, five, ten. Yes, max. I was. Yeah. 
Uh, so that started to make less sense at the same time that I got bit pretty hard by the acting bug. And then, you know, he was, like I said, he was like a real artist and he had us doing, you know, Shakespeare and appreciating, you know, major playwrights and studying theater history and, you know, our scene study was Ibsen and, and O'Neill and, and we knew who these we knew who these writers were as teenagers. And then the next thing I knew... You knew who they were because he taught you. Yeah. Right. And the next thing uh, I knew, you know, I was doing The Elephant Man. And and it was just... It was, a, the, it was an environment where, like, you take this seriously or get out. Like, I don't have time for kids... I don't have time to... It's sort of the same way I'm, I would imagine a really good disciplined football coach treats his football team. It's like, look, if you're going to loaf, go loaf somewhere else. He sure. just happened to do it with theater. Yeah. And, and this sort of theater program usually happens at a university level. Exactly. It never happens at a high school level. We did Godspell, <laughs> and I was the funny guy on campus who easily transitioned into auditioning for the one role in Godspell that does not have a solo, <laughs> which I nailed. Um, yeah, you know, we never did a musical. There had never been one, and there wasn't up to the time that I left because Mr. Buchanan and the head of our choir department, uh, I think, were very competitive and did not get along. And there was no way we were going to successfully pull off a good musical without those two. You're not going to get into my great young actors singing. Coming in and working together, and that didn't happen. Well, at least not while I was there. Uh, That's good to know. But you're right. We... You would have thought we would have had to be at a performing arts high school to get that kind of dedicated, you know, training and sort of and hands on teaching from someone who had actually experienced some success. Uh, How did it go over in the locker room uh, when you let the <laughs> fellows know that you were letting that particular sport go and headed uh, full full bore? Uh, total concentration of focus into the world of dramatics. There was a bridge that worked well because. Our theater tech class was made up primarily of the front of, line of the front line who needed to check the, check off their arts elective box. Uh -huh. So our sets were often built and painted by athletes, and then they would want to come see the play because they were like, "Totally built that, dude." Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that was a fun sort of marriage between our theater department and our athletics department, so that there was never any like. And then when you saw the first member of the football team shed a tear after the show, letting you know how well you had done. That's when I knew I had arrived, Katie. Did not, I mean, <laughs> I, I remember that moment personally, and I'm not even joking. Yeah. And it was just Godspell. Yeah. And there was an offensive lineman with a tear in his eye after the show saying. We definitely had that. You little shit, you nailed it. And that's and that feels good as a high school, a high schooler. Yeah. Um, so and, and so Buchanan... Rest his soul said, go east. He said, do it. And from Texas, that, that opens up a lot of area. Well, the first thing he said was, I'm going to endorse this if you can look at me and say that there is nothing else that you can imagine doing, which I'm sure is a variation of advice that you've either heard or given yourself. Yeah, I think before. any of us who go through the system and get any sort of success and ask the question, do you have advice? The first thing that comes to mind better be, are you, are you willing to throw everything else away? So he said that, and I said yes. And he said, all right, you need to go to New York. You need to study seriously for, um, you know, at least four more years and get your, you know, I want the, I want your foundation to be in theater. And how did that go at home when you had the discussion with the family? Tough. You know, I, I grew up uh, mostly as a military brat um, and the idea of going off and pursuing uh, the the dream of being a professional actor didn't hadn't seem, come up before. Didn't seem tangible. Didn't mm. didn't necessarily seem like something that you could reach out and grab. Right. Um, and I don't I don't begrudge my folks that it's a weird thing. Um, of course it is, especially when you might as well have said I'm going to be a brain surgeon, which would have technically made them proud, but they didn't see it coming. Especially when it's reasonable to go to a good school and get a degree in something very, very real um, so that you have a skill or something you can use to make a living. And and then, you know, if you want to go be crazy and give this whole acting thing a try, 
Um, yeah, it's called community theater. Yeah, have a back, you know. Knock yourself out. Um, and I was just like, look, guys, I, it, I'm already up against it because I don't know a soul. Right. And I'm going to have to work twice as hard. And I can't afford to be four years behind the curve. Like, I got to go now. And, um, and I'll pay for it myself if I have to. And my dad, uh, to his credit, came around pretty quick um, because he was like, look, this is clearly your dream. You're not. I'm not going to talk you out of your dream. Plus, he had seen you on the board. He had. He had seen me on the on the hardwoods, um, and uh, and my mom eventually came around. Yeah, I mean, it took me becoming a bona fide successful Paid. working actor. <laughs> <laughs> Paid. Yes, she was not quite as supportive when you were a waiter in New York. Right, but uh, but yeah, they're both on board now. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you come a long way, baby. Yeah, thanks, KP. Uh, the uh, the movie's called Treehouse. If you're hearing this after March 1st, 2019, I'm sure it's still available on Hulu. If you're hearing this beforehand, do not miss. Set the DVR. Do not miss. Watch it live if it doesn't fucking kill you. Yeah. March 1st, Hulu. They've got something over there that's pretty magical. Um, it is a horror movie anthology called Into the Dark. It's been going on since October. Where the fuck have you been? Check out... James Roday's uh, Treehouse is the name of the film. And it will uh, premiere and be there waiting for you when you're ready to give it a shot. The uh, series on the ABC network is called A Million Little Things. And um, now it's time for Kevin's Pop Quiz. What do I have to do to pass? Get like a 70? Nope. Okay. Between five and 15 points possible for each of the three questions. Once the final score is tabulated, it'll be posted on our website along with the current standing of the top 100. Are you ready? Yes. Question number one. Keith David or David Keith? Keith David. Correct. Question two. <laughs> Sorry. Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Uh, Carl Weathers. Correct. <laughs> final question. Good luck. Steve? Gay. It's a perfect score. Oh my god. Oh my god. How did it happen again? No one understands Oof. the difficult nature of these questions uh. until the answers are given. And then you realize, man. Goodness gracious. In this case, James Roday <laughs> nailed it and is already in the top five <laughs> among the top 100. Congratulations. That's got to feel good. I was a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to walk out of here Look with Look at Sam Kiefer, engineer of, of the stars, who just stopped by <laughs> just to hear the pop quiz, and he could not be happier for you. Goodness. Whew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can sign his chest on the way out I if will. you'd like. It's an opportunity we don't often offer, but I feel it's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, Treehouse, Hulu. Yeah. So happy for you, man. I'm so uh, thankful that I still know you. Uh-huh. And that- When are you going to come play poker? Is that a possibility? It is between now uh-huh. and June, like the middle of June. It's possible? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm going to hound you. I want you to hound me. Okay, good. I don't even know exactly what that means, but I'm open <laughs> to being hounded to the by, hounding? by KP. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ryan, last chance to look something up. Uh, where, what's the origin of I'm going to hound you? Yeah. Uh, because uh, it makes no sense to me Just either. Just be careful because you might find yourself getting loined. <laughs> Callback. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Nothing quite like the great comedic callbacks. <laughs> mm. All right. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kate. Uh, sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for Please. the folks at home if you don't mind. Uh, that is number 398. Just for you. No, 397. Wow, hell. One of the final episodes of the chat show that I am uh, thrilled beyond belief to have shared with a longtime dear friend and tremendous talent, Mr. James Roday. I want to thank Ryan, our engineer of the stars, for uh, making it all possible and for allowing me the embarrassing moment at the top of the show when I uh, once again had to ask him what his name is. Still unclear on the last name. Uh, So I'm just going to continue to call him Ryan. And I think he's comfortable with it. Let's see. Ryan, are you okay with that? Fine with me. Okay. Fine with me. Is that Italian? Uh, all right. Let's go to Corey Levin on post. Thank you for that. Jamie and Sammy, again, will be joining me once again for the final episode. It'll be two episodes. I'm going to chop it up into two. But it'll be live uh, in front of an audience on stage if you're in the Los Angeles area and can get tickets in time by the time you hear this. 
March 2nd, 4 p.m. Saturday, Dynasty Typewriter Theater, Pamela Adlon, Jim Jeffries. Get your tickets now at DynastyTypewriter.com. That's our show for now. Until next time and not much after, get out of my face.